Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. È un grande onore per me essere presente a questo grande evento per la presentazione della traduzione in inglese del libro di Don Luigi Giussani sulla teologia protestante americana, pubblicato dalla University Press McGill Queens. Sono molto lieto non solo perché questo è un lavoro accademico straordinario, ma anche perché la storia stessa di quest'opera ci aiuta a comprendere meglio il modo di padre Giussani di gestire e di affrontare la realtà. Lui molto spesso parlava della necessità di seguire le circostanze della vita, di The story of this work is an exemplification of what he taught us. And let me explain. First, Father Giussani obeyed the circumstances of his passion for ecumenism. The original Italian book came out in 1969. But Giussani had already begun researching American Protestantism and Russian Orthodoxy in the mid-1940s, in his third year of theology at the seminary. He had a particular love for the topic, and in particular for the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. He spent seven years reading American Protestant theology from the Puritans to the social gospel movement. Secondly, Giussani obeyed the circumstances concerning his bishop, Cardinal Colombo, who asked him to leave Milan for the United States for what was supposed to have been a prolonged period of time in 1965, and his visit to the United States allowed him to pursue his research on American Protestantism. And finally, Father Giussani had the keen sense in the mid-1960s that he should move from teaching to high school in the high school to lecturing in the Catholic University. And this meant publications, including a, bo including a book publication. And so he published the present book, in its original Italian, Teologia Protestante Americana in 1969. Giussani's interests were, yes, academic, but his passion delved much deeper, all the way to the existential level. Indeed, one of his greatest discoveries in his research was a phrase by Niebuhr that perhaps all of us would have passed over. When he read Niebuhr's statement that there is nothing so absurd as the answer to a question that you did not ask, Giussani was left dumbfounded. He repeated this phrase again and again over the years, and each time he mouthed it, the sentence was ever newer. It became an operating principle in his life and in that of many of his followers. And as John Waters reminded us yesterday, it is still possible for us to ask the question in the bunker. Today we have the great fortune of having two splendid friends present this work. I feel like the odd man out here as one is an Anglican priest and the other is a Baptist minister, both theologians. I am merely a Catholic layman and an historian, but delighted to be among such honored guests. Dr. Archie Spencer is associate professor in the John H. Pickford Distinguished Chair of Theology at Northwest Baptist Seminary at Trinity Western University in Langley. BC, Canada. Dr. Spencer is act actively engaged in the fields of systematic, philosophical, historical, and ecumenical theology. He's published a major work on the theology of Karl Barth. Dr. Andrew Davison is the tutor in doctrine at Westcott House at Cambridge University, which he joined in 2010 after four years teaching Christian theology at Oxford University. He holds doctorates in both science and philosophical theology and has published with Alison Milbank a book on ecclesiology for the parish. And just out a few weeks ago, Why Sacraments, as well as other works, and has been active in the English-Anglican-Catholic dialogue. 
We'll begin with Dr. Spencer. Bona sera. It's uh, great to be back uh, in Italy. Great to be back at Rimini. Good to see so many of my friends. Glad you're here. The title of my uh, paper tonight is Giussani's Contribution to the Protestant Faith and its Contribution to His. Upon the death of Karl Barth, the great Protestant theologian, it was said of him by his student, Eberhard Jungo, that a great man has condemned the world to explaining him. But Jungo also said, it could well be that great men are condemned to being explained by the world. In many respects, I feel that this is true of Luigi Giussani as well, on both counts. Though he would not have wanted the designation great man, it seems clear from his life, his charism, his literary legacy, and above all, his influence upon the Catholic faith, that he was indeed a great man. We now find ourselves in a position of having to explain him without his direct input. That I, an avowed Protestant theologian, now find myself in the position of explaining him to Catholics is as much a mystery to me as it is to my Catholic friends and my Protestant friends. There is something about the man, Giussani, that draws you to him. And so you could think of it that I am simply one of those who have been drawn. When I met him in the summer of 2003, he seemed breathlessly intense, uh, and yet, at the same time, serene, happy, and wide open to the world. His desire to speak to this rather obscure Baptist theologian has puzzled me to this very day. And I have to say that that encounter was truly a testament to his willingness to be open to ecumenical dialogue and mutual seeking of faith. In total now, it has been 16 years since I encountered Giussani's English publication, The Religious Sense. I now find myself at the point of saying openly and without fear of any Protestant reprisals, or for that matter, I suppose, any Catholic reprisals, what I think about his life and work and what it should mean for Protestants like myself. My reflections herein on his considerable charism come after a prolonged study of his writings and my experience within the lay Catholic movement he initiated, namely communion and liberation. I am very happy to say that the existence of this movement, simply hereafter, I will refer to a CL, is the greatest testimony to his ongoing legacy to the church and the world. My encounters with Don Jus, as he has been so affectionately referred to, on these many levels have led me to some important conclusions as to what I think he means for Protestants in general uh, and North American Protestants in particular. But it's also led me to some significant conclusions with respect to the Catholic faith that he professed as well. Because of time, of course, I can only paint in broad strokes and general indications. At any rate, in a forum such as this, I do not want to approach the matter on a purely academic level, though I have to say that that is my penchant. Certainly, the academic side of understanding Jasani is an important uh, concept, and we will have to do some academic analysis as we go through here. However, for my part, I will leave you to read what I've written already about Giussani if you want greater detail on these matters. The time for me has come to not hide behind the garb of the academy anymore, 
but to try and uh, uh, think uh, or, or to, to speak on a more pragmatic uh, level uh, and say what I really want to say plainly. So try to think of this presentation as an interview, except uh, I get to pose the questions and I get to answer them. In this interview, I simply want to sketch how and why I think Giussani's charism, especially as expressed in the book, American Protestant Theology, can speak to both Protestants and Catholics today. I often say to my students that there are really only four foundational realities that we are given to negotiate, speak about, and live in relation to every day of our lives. Namely, God, his creation, our fellow human beings, and ourselves. What we collectively and individually think about and how we live in relation to these realities determines how the rest of the human race will respond to the gift of life that animates us all. In Giussani's writings, there are three particular Christian graces that he has constant recourse to in helping us to come to terms with these foundational concepts. There are, of course, many more conduits of grace in creation, but in his thinking, these three are quite prominent. They include an anthropological aspect, namely, the religious sense, a Christological aspect, namely the event of the incarnation of God in the God-man, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and an ecclesiological aspect, namely the one holy Catholic Church, which for Giussani is the historic and contemporary unfolding of these previous two graces. While Protestants might nuance each of these graces differently, by and large, we share a common emphasis here. Giussani was constantly concerned that Christians and Christianity maintain its vital connection to and appreciation of these graces. Furthermore, he was so concerned with them in a rather charismatic ecumenical, and some would even say prophetic way. He sought to speak to a generation of young people that, uh, or, or whatever their, their persuasion might have been about these matters. So let's take a brief look at each in turn, partly through his own work, and partly through my own experience, which I hope you will understand uh, that I must refer to in this paper because I have limited Protestant experience of Giussani in other means. So let's look first at the anthropological grace of the religious sense. In my introduction to his American Protestant theology, I trace out the religious phenomena in North American Protestantism that Giussani is constantly trying to expose in his treatment of his, its history. But the question I have yet to raise directly, and now here in this situation, will, is simply why is this North American religious phenomenology so important to Giussani? Part of the reason, um, I think, uh, is that North American, uh, or part of the reason I have not, sorry, raised this question thus far in my interactions with Giussani and CL is because there really is insufficient evidence in Giussani to support any experiential or theoretical reasons why he would want to highlight Protestant individualization of the religious sense. It's not something he talks about directly to my knowledge, and so there is no record uh, of the question. But a few general impressions now have come to me over and over as I have reflected on Giussani's own legacy and uh, especially as it is related to the personal nature of religious faith. So first, let me say the following about this anthropological 
principle. From what I can gather from the life of Giussani, his concern very early on in his career as a priest was to animate a whole generation of youth with respect to the divine foundations of the cosmos and their own existence. Maybe Giussani saw in American Protestantism a deep dynamism and the connection with the principal uh, grace of the sense of the divine, or the, also known as the seed of religion, uh, the consciousness of which had perhaps waned in his own Catholic experience and in the context in which he worked. Perhaps it had become obscured and buried beneath layers of tradition or mundane religious practice uh, such that it could no longer find a vital uh, individual expression within the confines of his own Catholic experience. As one reads American Protestant theology, one gets the sense of a deep appreciation for the expression of faith and religious fervor he observes in the great evangelical preachers like Cotton Mather, uh, Jonathan Edwards, and the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Certainly as, a Catholic, uh, as Catholic theologians Eliza Bozzi and Angelo Scola have demonstrated, Jonathan Edwards exerted no small influence on Giussani's own development of thought about the personal individualist nature of religion. But as I said, my question is not one of theory formation here, as I observe Giussani's reactions and interactions with the Protestant faith. Let me put the question a little differently. To what degree, to what degree did uh, Giussani himself get religion? to use the old southern expression for the conversion experience. Surely his experience in America during this period of writing and research would have reminded him that it was not enough to just be religious, but individually and personally to have one's total reality altered by the religious point of view this is certainly the overwhelming impression one gets from reading Giussani's The Religious Sense. In my own personal encounter with Giussani, I remember being deeply impressed by the level of his personal commitment to Jesus Christ. Now, lest my Catholic friends worry that I'm reading too much into this experience with Protestantism in America. Let me affirm that I am sure he drew the primary inspiration for his faith from his Catholic context, both before and after his encounter with North American Protestantism. But was it enhanced on the personal side by his encounter with American Protestantism? Did he receive something extra from his encounter with Protestantism that enabled him to personally ascend above the ordinariness of religious life as a priest so that he could own it on a more deeply personal level than he previously had? Did he see this personal faith as a key to animating and revivifying the faith of an otherwise ossified Italian religious expression, especially among the youth that he left behind in Italy and eventually came back home to? I certainly would not want to draw an absolute conclusion here but here is my dilemma. In everything that I have read and experienced in my encounter with him, personally, in his writings, and in the form of the movement that he provoked, 
he seems to cry out, own your faith. Own it personally. Your religious nature is a grace, a gift that requires not only communal life, but also deep and abiding personal commitment. It is your very anthropological constitution. It is what makes you human. So at this point, allow me to get a little personal in order to illustrate this point. As far as I can tell, judging from what my friends in CL have told me, including John Zuki here beside me, and how they treat me, it would seem that I have become a member of the fraternity, even though I am not a Catholic. How long this grace will be extended to me, I have no way of knowing. But I'm happy to belong to it and to live in the moment of this incredible openness. However, it is precisely out of this experience, in fact, that I have seen and heard this call to personal faith expressed many, many times over. Furthermore, I have no less than the authority of Cardinal Angelo Scola to appeal to, who is incidentally a member of the fraternity himself. At the meeting of responsibles in 2007, he gave us an address on owning our baptism. And he said, it is not enough to be baptized into the church, but that one, quote unquote, had to own one's baptism personally in order to live out the true Catholic faith. I am sure he meant this in an entirely Catholic way, but I have to say that at the time it struck me as a very Protestant thing to say. Giussani's charism was no doubt at work even then. The need for personal faith is not really a foreign idea to the Catholic tradition, but it's certainly not so prominent as it is in Protestantism. It is, however, everywhere present in the movement's CO. And there is no doubt in my mind that Giussani promoted the idea of deep personal engagement in living out one's faith. So again, I ask the question, did his encounter with Protestantism in America or his study of it for that matter, remind him of the need for this Christian imperative? I think maybe so. But assuming this was the case, this position does, uh, what position does this leave us Protestants in with respect to Jasani and his Catholic faith? Should we assume now that we have nothing to learn from him about personal religion and everything to teach? Not at all. In fact, except for a few instances, both mainstream and evangelical Protestant faith has lost its connection to the truly religious dimension of human nature in far greater degrees and with more far-reaching consequences than it might have done among the Catholic youth that Giussani sought to serve. In Protestantism, religion, the religious sense, has been twisted beyond all recognition. It has been anthropocentrized, idolatrized, commodified, and reduced in a number of different ways. 
the human religious nature is seen by most Protestants today as either a mere moral impulse, an inner intuition, a consciousness of God, pure experience for its own sake, or part of the road to pure intellection and the development of mind, which of course must be eventually passed over. Certainly, religion has all of these dimensions about it, but it cannot be reduced to any one of these. However, this tendency to reduce our religious nature is now as true of American Protestant experience as it was in the 18th to early 20th century liberal Protestant era of Europe. In those centuries in Europe, this reduction of the religious sense ultimately led to the rise of the secular state, the privatization of religion, the dissolution of divine authority in matters moral, and the mechanization or technocratization of our existence, making humans mere cogs in a great process of an otherwise unconserved evolving universe. In the early years of North America, this fundamental religious anthropology, perhaps more pure in the form that Giussani encountered it in his time, has now become a self-indulgent, free-floating, consumption of the human spirit itself. Life has become rarefied by the pursuit of things, the pursuit of the human body, and by the pursuit of pleasure for its own sake. Furthermore, what passes for evangelical faith in North America today is a mere shadow of its former self. It is more a reflection of the culture of self-centered consumption than a religion entirely calling all humanity to seek its meaning on a higher plane. In America today, culture leads, religion follows. It is forgetful of its roots in the European Reformation and the history of the Christian faith. Furthermore, it is forgetful of God. More than ever, if Protestant faith, especially in its sectarian form, expects to continue to be identified with true religion, it will have to get back into touch with the true religious intuition that formed its fundamental connection with God, with our world, with ourselves, and with one another. Indeed, as Giussani often points out, this individualization of the religious can have catastrophic effects when it becomes confused with some other general anthropological phenomena. It can lead to the displacement of the other equally necessary graces of incarnate revelation and communal life. If, however, we Protestants attend once again to the fundamental fact of our orientation towards a transcendent other, then there is the possibility of a revitalization of faith and practice in community. It is always a human tendency to obscure the religious sense within us.
Even the greatest of all Protestant theologians, John Kelvin, recognized that our religious nature can be distorted, turned inward, or idolatrized by our sinful nature. St. Paul himself recognized this strong possibility. The key is to recognize our religious nature not just as a mark of our uniqueness in creation or of our special place within it, but also, as Giussani would remind us, as an indication of our fundamental need to be ever focused on the truth that binds us to God, to his universe, our fellow human beings, and ourselves. It is not enough for late modern Protestants to affirm with Socrates, know thyself. They must rather affirm with Augustine and Kelvin that knowing God and the self come together and is the inexorable way to true knowledge. Giussani's charism is, in this respect, the gift of enabling us to see the truly graced nature of the religious principle that grounds us. If nothing else, reading Giussani's American Protestant theology should reorient us away from false reductionisms of the religious sense to the true impulse that also animates us. So once again, let me turn to my experience over the last 16 years to solidify that last point. When I am in the context of CL, I find myself in contact with the religious sense very often. Folks who follow the intuition of Jasani work hard to bring every experience into the realm of its ultimate meaning with respect to the Christ encounter, the community of faith, and their religious nature. They test their experience by the rule of the gospel and allow the community to form that experience into a meaningful individual and communal waypoint for divine encounter. However, in my opinion, this practice is not so much to do with being Catholic or Protestant. For the religious nature that we possess animates us all, and in equal degree. Rather, our Protestant lack of capacity to discern the true encounter with God in day-to-day -day experience has everything to do with the tendency to pervert the religious sense in our Protestant individualism. On this level, Giussani has much to teach us about our own faith, let alone to teach Catholics about theirs. Now, I could say much more about this point, but let me move to the second point, the, the Christological grace of revelation. The religious nature is not the only element we share with the Catholic faith. The one encounter that can stand as common ground above and beyond our religious nature is the encounter of God with our humanity in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I have to admit that no single element in Jesani's thought and his life has intrigued me more than this. Jusani, in his desire to train the religious intuition of his young people in the right direction, never tires of pointing them to Jesus Christ, the one true and primary 
sacramental encounter of God with the world. Again, I'm going to resist the impulse to demonstrate this academically. The movement provoked by Giussani, CL, lives its very life from the intention of a real encounter with Jesus Christ in every moment of its existence. It longs for it. It sighs and it cries for it. It delights in the encounter with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. In this sense, it is the truest that it could possibly be to its founder. In fact, I would say the continuation of the charism of Giussani in CL depends upon this Christological point. So let us make no mistake that when we are speaking of the encounter with Jesus Christ, Giussani means the real event in real time and space, the real coming of the God-man. This is for Giussani the origin of the Christian claim. There is also no mistaking the fact that this real event seems to have forced itself onto the imagination and experience of Giussani in his Catholic experience of the faith. It was for him entirely consonant with that faith. But here I have to raise another question. Was the language of a real encounter with the real Jesus Christ a part of the everyday religious life of his parishioners and fellow Catholics outside of the Mass? Again, I do not know for sure but I suspect not. So let me ask a further question. Did Giussani find in Protestant thought a certain stock and trade language that enabled him to give expression to a more vital and personal faith in order to help the youth in his charge? Again, this is the, uh, uh, I think this is the case, but I have no data other than experience to back that up. What I am certain of is this, that he himself had many personal encounters with Christ. As with the movement he provoked, he lived for it, he longed for it, and he looked for it at every turn. If I were to summarize Giussani's thought in one sentence, it would go something like this. I have encountered the mystery of true God and true man in Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And he has been and ever will be the ground of our own reality because he is the ground of the reality of God. This was true for Giussani in everything he did and said. As I have read in the history of Christian theology, both Protestant and Catholic, only one other theologian in Protestant circles has been so Christocentric, namely Karl Barth, whom I shall mention momentarily. For me, it is the experience of this language of encounter in CL and the ongoing charism of Chisani that confirms the centrality of the language and experience of encounter with Christ. Furthermore, Protestant thought and experience in its history, especially that of the Great Awakenings in America, 
is replete with such language. Jonathan Edwards come, becomes a catalyst in making the language of encounter the model by which Protestant sectarians expand in the Americas. Giussani certainly tapped into this, but not in a utilitarian way. This is not the manipulation of language in order to get at an existential experience. Rather, in it, he sees a new way to express a reality that always impressed itself upon his religious nature. The need for personal faith in and relationship to Jesus Christ. This is what animated Giussani. Well, once more, it would seem we Protestants are in a position of relative strength. Giussani might not have so much to teach us after all. Perhaps in the early years of Protestantism, he might have less to teach us, but not in the current context. Giussani reminds us once again that Jesus Christ of Nazareth in his divinity and in his humanity is the key to identifying the substance of revelation that our human nature longs for. With a similar interest in mind, Karl Barth intimates that all Christological heresies of the church are either docetic or ebionetic in nature. That is to say, they either deny the divinity of Christ, as with Ebionism, or they deny the humanity of Christ, as with Doceticism. Protestant Christianity today stands in danger of either and or both. In the contemporary Protestant circumstance, both in Europe and in North America. Thinking and preaching about Jesus, the God-man, has become somewhat of an embarrassment for us. In our Protestant desire for cultural relevance we, uh, and acceptance, we seem to want to reduce the role of Christ in our religious life and experience. We worry over the particularity of Christ and the offense he might cause if we hold exclusively to our Christological orientation of faith. Furthermore, and perhaps more to the point, Jesus confronts us too much. He challenges our priorities, undermines our comforts, and calls us to give up that which we hold so dear. So we Protestants make of him a paragon of some idealized humanity, but not really divine. Or we make the opposite mistake of making of him such an idealized divinity that he could not really suffer with us or know us intimately. Sometimes we evangelical Protestants are completely utilitarian in our Christology, calling upon him when we have need, but otherwise living as if he did not exist. In early Protestant experience, in Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, the Anabaptists, the Puritans, the New England sectarians. Jesus Christ was the very revelation of God, the ground of our human existence. However, in the transposition of our rarefied view of our human nature, we have made our own humanity the ground of Christ's existence. 
In the 19th century, Ludwig Feuerbach rightly criticized liberal Protestantism when he said in respect to its religious thought, the secret of theology is that it is only, after all, anthropology. The same criticism could be leveled at some evangelical Protestants today. Giussani's treatment of American Protestantism reminds Protestants of the truly Christological and revelatory roots of their desire to deepen their religious experience. Protestants would do well to read more Giussani, if only to remind them that their faith means nothing if it does not confess without embarrassment, reduction, or reservation the revelation of God and humanity in the one Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Giussani says, the historical encounter with this man constitutes an encounter with the resolving and clarifying point of human experience. Says Giussani, our adult faith begins with our answer to Jesus' question, and you, who do you say that I am? Protestants in North America and Europe used to be in a good position to answer this question unequivocally and unambiguously. Certainly sectarian Protestantism could give an affirmative answer even 60 years ago. Some groups still can. Now, however, for the most part, equivocation, prevarication, and ambiguity are the orders of the day when many American Protestants are asked the question by Christ, who do you say that I am? We stand in need of a Protestant Giussani, one willing to say that in Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the God-man, very God of very God, very man of very man, we have been given both the revelation of God and our own humanity exclusively and in no uncertain terms. Indeed, Jesus Christ and the daybreak of our reality belong together. Now, just a few more minutes as I turn to the final principle, the ecclesial grace of community. Uh, let me remind you that I am suggesting that Giussani needs a hearing in Protestant context today on three levels, anthropologically, Christologically, and now ecclesiologically. Before we take up this theme in Giussani directly, allow me to reflect a bit on my recent ecumenical experience in order to illustrate Giussani's significance for Catholic-Protestant dialogue on this issue. During the spring term of 2013, I was invited by a Catholic undergraduate college to team teach a course in ecumenism with my longtime CL friend, Dr. Christoph Potvorovsky. The college's name is Redeemer Pacific College. It is located on the campus upon which I teach, Trinity Western College, in Langley, British Columbia, Canada. Redeemer Pacific is a unique experience in ecumenism in that it is the first affiliated Catholic school 
to offer undergraduate education on our Protestant evangelical campus with the full support of the university and the college leadership. Christopher and I originally met through CL in Montreal in 2002. Our friendship was deepened when we traveled together in 2003 here to Rimini. Divine Providence has now so beautifully arranged this relationship that we now teach on the same campus together as of this past year. Our shared interest in theology and ecumenical dialogue led us to consider designing this course together. Three writers came to be quite influential. They were Karl Barth, Hans Urs von Balthasar, and of course Luigi Giussani. The key to the course came to be the display of friendship between Christoph and myself. The experience was beautiful to say the least and would need a full section just to talk about it. We were both struck by Giussani's capacity to bring us together. Our course really began though with Hans Urs von Balthasar in a well-known book titled The Theology of Karl Barth. Von Balthasar opens with an excellent chapter on ecumenical dialogue and at one point makes an extraordinary claim. Citing Montesquieu's prophecy, Von Balthasar writes, and I cite, I predict that the Catholic religion will one day destroy the Protestant religion and then all Catholics will become Protestants. <laughs> Following up upon this thought, von Balthasar goes on to say something rather extraordinary with respect to the unity of the church. He writes, again I cite, there might be a grain of truth in Montesquieu's remark, at least to this extent. Reunion can never happen if one side tries to subjugate the other. Both sides often begin their dialogue with this false ideal, but reunion will never come about except through humble submission by both sides to their common Lord and their mutual rapprochement in fraternal love, which includes taking seriously the background and approach of the other side. I'm almost done. Now that, uh, now what does all of this have to do with Giussani? and his approach to American Protestant theology. Well, in my opinion, Giussani is both the type and an excellent example of this rapprochement in the best possible sense. Christoph and I found him to be very useful in bringing together our evangelical Protestant and Catholic students. It is particularly his capacity to absorb the Protestant religious spirit, dissolve its sense of protest, and then to recast it in the light of the central principle of ecclesial unity, the una sancta, the one holy church. That qualifies him as a true ecumenist. All the way through Giussani's work, there is a deep and abiding appreciation for his Protestant faith, especially in its individualist expression, while at the same time there is a gentle, chiding critique of its lack of moorings and individualism in the church as 
one holy and Catholic. In his Why the Church, Giussani declares that Protestantism cannot continue to exist as a prime expression of faith without such moorings in the community of faith. To that end, the real object of ecumenism is not a unity based on dogma, but a unity that begins with the religious sense, the anthropological principle, which is grounded in the event of the incarnation, the Christological principle, and is held together in common human experience by the desire for unity at least and constant prayer for its final achievement at most. And this is the ecclesiological principle. More than ever, in the history of Christianity, the church needs unity. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. Sadly, however, when I turn to my Protestant experience, I find the principle of ecclesial unity to be so completely dissolved in a theology of the church invisible that it can hardly exist on the horizon of the Protestant individual consciousness of faith. The Christian religion has been so transcendentalized in Protestantism that the concept of visible unity cannot have a place in the consciousness of most Protestants. Its individualism has turned from being its greatest strength in the recovery of its faith to its greatest nemesis and indeed the final basis of the denial of that very faith in late modern times. Perhaps we have finally come to the place where Giussani can teach us Protestants how to be good small c Catholics. While at the same time he can teach Catholics, big C, <laughs> to be good, small p, Protestants. In my opinion, this is the ecumenical ecclesiology that drives Giussani. Everywhere you look in the man himself, in his writings, or in the legacy of the movement he has provoked, you see these common graces cropping up everywhere. The religious spirit of humanity, its summary in the God-man, Jesus Christ, and its preservation in the one holy body of Christ, the church. These enable a complete realization of ourselves, of our neighbors, of our creation, and in a most encompassing way, of our God. Certainly Protestants can no longer hide behind the doctrine of the church invisible in order to duck the question of unity. In his little essay on the church and the churches, Karl Barth warns us Protestants that there can be no recourse to this doctrine of the invisible church where the unity of faith and ecumenical engagement is concerned. Bart describes the division of the church in all its forms, Eastern, Protestant, and Catholic, as a festering wound in the sight of Christ that seems incurable. And yet it is also a sin that somehow must be overcome. I doubt that this will happen in our lifetime. But theologians like Luigi Giussani give us hope for such a rapprochement. Giussani's American Protestant theology 
represents a significant achievement along this path. So now let me finally very briefly conclude. On a personal level, I have to say that my engagement with Jusani thus far has provoked this homesickness for the Una Sancta, the One Holy. Mostly because many of my Protestant brothers and sisters, though not all, have lost what it means to be a community of faith. So it is my desire as a Protestant theologian to promote and foster a greater degree of communion with Christ, communio unio cum Christo. Wherever I go, in whatever I do, and with whomever I meet. Don Giussani represents for me not only the effective expression of this desire in his life and writings, but also in his legacy, embodied in the many beautiful forms. Now my friends, known as communion and liberation, thank you very much. I am this fourth time grateful for your invitation to be with you in Rimini among friends. Now I'm aware that 80 minutes is a long time to sit down. So I suggest a break of 15 seconds for you to stand up and stretch your legs. That's my job. <laughs> Is that all right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Good. Fifteen seconds. Pardon? I picked up Father Giussani's book, not knowing what to expect. I was surprised. Not surprised by how good it is, but surprised by the way in which it is good. I expected to benefit from what emerged of Giussani's own opinions. In fact, he puts himself almost entirely in the background and tells a story, the story of American Protestant theology. In his writing, Father Giussani usually wears his erudition lightly. Here, without trying to be clever, he is nonetheless extremely erudite. American Protestant theology is a work of impressive scholarship. It marks a significant addition to the literature of Giussani now in English. For one thing, it demonstrates Giussani's standing as a scholar. In other words, Giussani's achievement with this book is simply to do what he sets out to do, to educate his reader on a topic. His knowledge of the figures and texts under discussion is exhaustive. It's also beautifully written and translated, and the structure is crystal clear. Giussani describes American Protestantism as embodying an adventurous spiritual life. He certainly communicates that spirit of adventure in his book. And when it is a story of misadventure, he does not gloat. I will certainly recommend Giussani's book to my students in future. The book left me fascinated and speculating about the influence of the American theology Giussani encountered on his own method and approach. 
but to investigate that would be a work of historical scholarship that I am not best placed to provide. Instead, I propose to think through the spirit and history of American Protestant theology as it is presented by Giussani and reflect on how it overlaps and differs from Giussani's own approach. Foundational for Giussani, as we have heard, is a focus on Jesus Christ and on Christ as contemporaneous with us. And this Christocentrism is found in many of the authors he discusses, especially around the turn of the 20th century. Throughout the story of the book, we also encounter the question of freedom. I suppose debates about freedom would inevitably loom large in a Protestant tradition so much influenced by Calvin, with all that entails about whether or not human beings are free. More than that, we could say that freedom has a particular place in Protestantism, since the primal Protestant event was an exercise in what was taken to be freedom, the break with Rome. This is the protest of Protestantism, the exertion, as the reformers perceived it, of freedom. We will return to this at the end. Giussani also placed a new emphasis on the freedom of the Christian. His concern for freedom was no doubt one of the reasons that he initially faced some suspicion, even opposition, from the hierarchy of the church. Giussani wished that no one should believe anything or live a certain way simply because he had told them to, or anyone else had told them to. Don't just trust me, he was saying. Rather, see if this is true and trustworthy in your concrete experience, and if you can recognize its truth in the business of living. Indeed, if there was disagreement over whether some path or choice was indeed good and true, perhaps a disagreement between Giussani and a student, he would challenge that student to go deeply into what he or she proposed, but then to ask whether it truly brought satisfaction in life, if it really made sense of the person. Judge all things, as St. Paul wrote. Hold fast to that which is good. In other words, a central question for Giussani was, does it work? That question suggests a relation to the American pragmatic tradition, a pragmatism that was so important for American Protestant thought. And yet, there is also a profound difference between Giussani and pragmatism. Yes, we find in Giussani something of what he calls the Protestant preference for experience over speculation, that validation is based on experiential results. A clear parallel, indeed. But Giussani was also concerned with the objective truth of things. He was no relativist, nor without a metaphysical compass. So while we do recognize a common concern with this American pragmatism, the concern that the faith must make a difference, we cannot simply call Giussani a pragmatist. Although experience has such an important place in Giussani's outlook, he is not like those American theologians for whom 
as he relates, experience becomes everything. So that theology is no longer, to quote him, God's redemptive activity, but rather about an elaboration of man's experience of God. Nor is there the anti-intellectualism in Giussani that is sometimes to be found in the authors he discusses. For one of them, for instance, dogma is merely dark and feeble in contrast with spirit and inspiration. Inner light trumps church tradition. For Giussani, there is a place for dogma, and that place is the community where the concrete and objective teaching of the church is explored in relation to experience, which has its own concreteness and objectivity. We see something of Giussani's desire to combine thought and experience in his respect for Jonathan Edwards. Giussani clearly appreciated Edwards for being at once a great theorist of experience and also a great scholar who spent hours poring over his books. I'll continue with this theme of community, but for a moment I want to offer a challenge to you. Giussani put the emphasis on experience over learning doctrine by rote and put an emphasis on what captivated the imagination over metaphysics. Is that not partly because he could take the doctrine and the metaphysics for granted? Dogma and metaphysics were being taught. Unfortunately, they were almost all that was being taught, oh, and morals. Our situation is different. In our chronically less doctrinal, less metaphysical age, it might be necessary to pay more attention to these aspects of the faith in a more explicit way, perhaps, than Giussani did in his time, precisely so as to be faithful to the balance between life and ideas that Giussani wished to achieve. Back to that importance of community. A striking feature of the story of American Protestant thought, as Giussani relates it, is the way in which it is by turns strongly individualistic, then strongly communitarian. Indeed, the story as he tells it lurches from one of these poles to the other. An emphasis on severe individualism, and next, an all-encompassing emphasis on the social aspect. We see that in the transcendentalists, we see that in personalism. And then, on the other hand, we have the social gospel of Rauschenbusch. And while his emphasis on social justice is very welcome, that social, social dimension could be taken so far that Christianity hardly concerned the individual anymore. The gospel, sin, salvation became about our part uh, as social agents. And then with Reinhold Niebuhr, who fascinated Giussani, we're back with the individual. I might say in passing, I was surprised how courteous Giussani is towards Niebuhr. In so many ways, I find Niebuhr's work horrific. But I will try to learn some courtesy from Father Giussani and move on. In contrast to this alteration between individual and society, Giussani's work was neither individualistic nor social to the extent of erasing the individual. He placed the individual within a communal whole, but also attended to the existentialist dimension of the individual, that each of us is called to make a choice, to live. Giussani was concerned in both 
economics and in the Christian life with the small group, which is neither the lone individual nor the anonymous collective. We could say that the whole of his economics with its subsidiarity and of his approach to the spiritual life was a stand against anonymity. Since anonymity, after all, is equally a feature of individualism and of amorphous communitarianism. And Giussani resisted both. For Giussani, the Christian life is to be lived in community, avoiding anonymity. We are to embrace the concrete particularity of where we are and, importantly, whom we know and whom we love. Throughout the book, we find American Protestant theologians praising disinterestedness. Here, Giussani strikes me as saying the opposite. We love perfectly, not by loving in general, but by loving in particular. We need not be disinterested. My final discussion of themes uh, is of optimism and pessimism, two terms that Giussani uses a great deal in the book. Again, American Protestant theology, as he persuasively recounts it, veered from one to the other. We have extraordinary optimism, for instance, in Rauschenbusch, followed by pessimism in, say, Niebuhr or Tillich. If I had to put Giussani and CL anywhere on this axis, I would put you towards optimism, not pessimism. Although you do occasionally have a meeting with a pessimistic title like The Human Emergency. But this pessimism-optimism axis may not be the right one. Ideally, rather than aligning you with either, I would say that you are joyful. And that is to say something rather different from either pessimism or optimism. Part of your relation to optimism and pessimism is simply that you are Catholics and that you therefore have the saints held before you. I see such a contrast here with what I would call Niebuhr's ethical impossibilism. So he writes, the ethical demands made by Jesus are incapable of fulfillment in the present existence of man. In contrast, the saints hold out the possibility of real sanctity, of real fulfillment in our present existence. I hope and indeed I expect that Father Giussani will one day be counted among these saints. The other, the other side of Niebuhr's ethical impossibilism is his idea that anything less than perfect love is destructive of life. It's all or nothing. Paradoxically, the story of the saints, of their achievement of perfect sanctity, suggests the opposite. The saints show the value of even imperfect sanctity, since in them we encounter the possibility of a growth in holiness. The saints show us that the story of a journey to God is good as a story, not simply as an ending. Giussani's book often lights upon dualisms between grace and nature, faith and reason, the individual and the community. All this finds its antithesis in Giussani. Again and again he outwits the dualisms that can snag and entangle the Christian. A prime example of a dualism is the supposed distinction between self-interest and pure ethical love told throughout the story of this book. I think you deny this distinction. I encounter in your movement 
a profound sense that when I discover what is truly good for me, it will be truly good for you, and that I find my true good in what is good for my neighbour. When it comes to economics, this is part of what subsidiarity means. Giussani proposes a Christianity full of the message of Christ in John 10. I have come that they may have life and have it in all its fullness. Giussani trusted that the good is one because the good is ultimately God. Uh, I shall leave a, a small section out. Giussani's survey ends with the radical theology or death of God theology of the 1960s. How should we bring the story up to date? I find Giussani's analysis in these pages to be one of the most acute and helpful contributions of the whole book. He describes the death of God movement as profoundly optimistic. This is theology so confident that it can do without God. As a watershed, he points to the death of his beloved T.S. Eliot, my fellow Anglican, on the 4th of January 1965. If Eliot's period had been pessimistic, and it certainly had, it was a pessimism where the awfulness of things pointed to our need for God. In contrast, the death of God theology that followed had a liberal optimism with no need for a transcendent reference. Now, Giussani is clever here. Death of God theology might look like an appalling denial of all that the best Protestant theology had affirmed, namely the reality and importance of God. In a sense, it was. However, Giussani says this atheist theology can also be seen as the apotheosis and fulfillment of the Protestant project. As Tillich had put it, the Protestant spirit is in essence one of protest against any definition of God and any identification of God's activity with something in the world, namely the church. Death of God theology simply takes this all the way and seeks to exterminate the very word God and of all that has gone along with thinking about God, namely the church. If, with the denial of God, with the denial of theology, Protestantism had run its course of protest to the end, what remains? What would happen after the end of Giussani's historical account? What comes next? Well, last year I was in Chicago at the American Academy of Religion, which is the international equivalent for theologians of the meeting. It's not quite as big. And as I browsed the stalls of the big American Protestant publishing houses, I saw books everywhere on the fathers, on the creeds, on doctrine. The story that comes after the end of Giussani's book is to some extent one of a Catholic turn in American Protestant theology. One last page, a conclusion. Before I sat down to write this paper, I asked some CL friends a question. What might the participants at the meeting find most useful from my discussion of the book? They gave me a characteristically CL response. Tell us, they said, why the book is important to you. Well, the book is important to me because it reminds me that it was through CL that I reconnected with the Protestantism of my youth. That Protestantism had been, in some ways, a great foundation for later Christian life, and in other ways, it did me no favors. And on that account, I rather ran from it. CL awakened me to rediscover the virtues of the Protestant sensibility. CL did so because I find in CL so much of the best of the Protestant approach to Christianity. 
two examples. There is a zeal among you that I otherwise encounter most often among evangelicals. And there is an attention to experience which reminded me at first of the charismatic tradition that I had very definitely left behind. Indeed, because of that personal history, I found some of these characteristics of CL a little terrifying at first. Consequently, I can say with all seriousness that it has been a Roman Catholic movement, it has been CL, that helped me to make peace with my Protestant charismatic past. In rediscovering what experience means, albeit in Giussani's carefully inflected way, I found a new commonality with my Protestant colleagues and friends. For all my tradition remains within the Anglican tradition of Catholicism and Thomism. Giussani's excellent book lays before us the spirit of American Protestant theology. And we find there what the English call a mixed bag. In fact, I was rather struck by the wrong terms. But there is something deeply attractive about this tradition and a really good witness to that is Giussani's interest in this world throughout this book. But for me, the change of life has come not from his book, but from the community he formed. Thank you. Archie, Archie Spencer wondered aloud whether we need a Protestant Giussani. But, but what Andrew Davison said now, what Archie said earlier, makes me think that we had a Father Giussani and have a Father Giussani that reached and continues to reach the Protestant world, the Anglican world, the Jewish world, the atheist world, etc., etc. And this today has been, yes, an academic encounter, but an ecumenical encounter. And it makes me think of a story. Today, we're, today we're, we are you know, celebrating, introducing this translation of Father Giussani's work in Protestantism by McGill Queens University Press. Back in 1996, I met uh, Father Giussani a few months before the first book to be translated in English by the press, The Religious Sense, was published. And I had a hand in that, uh, getting the book published in, into, in English and translating it. And Father Giussani was awestruck by, how, by, by the work of the mystery of God in all of this. And he asked me three times to tell him how this all happened. <laughs> And he still looked puzzled by all this. And then he looked at me and screwed his eyes on me and said, you are at the origin of all this. And he wouldn't take his eyes off me. And then he said, almost puzzled again, no, I'm at the origin of this because I wrote the book. <laughs> And then he stopped again, and still with his eyes fixed on me, said, no, he, he's at the origin of all this. <laughs> Yesterday, uh, John Waters said, how can we not give a name to that origin, that mystery who enters our lives? Because only Christ, that mystery, can be at the source of this miracle that we saw today, of this ecumenical experience with our friends from the Protestant and the Anglican world. Thank you.